Welcome, everyone, to the latest episode of Headlines in History with me, your host, John Mollick. You'll see if you aren't watching on YouTube today, I'm, I'm, I'm rolling out with some more Bills gear. Uh, another Bills Sunday here as we get ready for the game, 4 o'clock against Seahawks. Let's go, Bills. But let's also talk something more important. This week, I want to talk about strategy and diplomacy. You know, I was going back and forth as to, just checking my notes here, going back and forth about what I wanted to talk about this week. There was a lot going on. There's the there's North Koreans that are going to be fighting potentially in Russia. Um, what So far, we think that they're in Kursk. And then we have the Israeli tit for tat back and forth just yesterday, two nights ago. I'm recording here on Sunday, the 27th. Two nights ago, we had the response to Iran from Israel. And really, it was that issue that brought me to having to want to have this conversation that I'm having here today. Okay. I want, I want to talk about diplomacy and I want to talk about strategy and the bigger picture as it relates to all of this tactical level operational stuff, if you will, that happens not only particularly right now between Israel and Iran, but generally speaking, I think what happens in today's day and age, and we see it on a whole broad spectrum of conversations on the internet is that we where you know let's admit we get a lot of this stuff from the internet right that and, and i participate in this stuff just just being in the world that i'm in and th- the thought is so short-sighted and oftentimes you don't have the you don't have participants that are the deep thinkers right one of the one of the podcasts i really like to listen to some some free advertising here is is in Moscow Shadows with Mark Galiati. And brilliant guy, author, Russian expert, hands down. And he gets into some very, very in-depth, specific history observations from a whole slew of things, from the military standpoint, the diplomatic standpoint, cultural, all these different things. And he often talks about how he doesn't like to wade into the most current events. He doesn't like to dip his toes into who who's going to be the first to react to this or that. Because a lot of times these complicated factors, they take time to understand. You know, the facts have to come out, if you will. And, and we have to figure out what actually is happening. We don't have to be the first, but we should be the the one that's right. Right? Almost almost in the way that Apple looks at taking on technologies. They don't necessarily want to be the first to get something out, but they want to do it the best. And we're really losing a lot of that a lot of that aspect of complicated conversations in today's internet. Now, let, let me say there's value in being first. Okay. Another another friend of mine, Ryan Macbeth, did a live the other day on YouTube as this. Israeli and Iran back and forth was happening. And he went on live and he was answering questions as to how this may work or how that may work or if the F-35s were involved and, you know, what type of air defense capabilities the Iranians had and whether they had the capacity or capability to defend against Israel. What is it that Israel wanted to attack? What are they trying to accomplish? You know, maybe operationally I'll even go, meaning kind of bigger picture, not right in the actual tactical moment. And so, so don't get me wrong, it's not that there's not value in any of those things. There is, but the problem comes in when we take a limited view, when we take a tactical perspective, and then we try to use that data and understanding to make strategic claims. And we try to make, we try to make points that we think are true based on the 50-meter target information we have, not the 250-meter target or the 300-meter target information, okay? Okay, before we before we go on, remember, uh, even though I remain in the business, um, anything that I say here today and or any other episode, anything I'm talking about here is clearly an opinion just my own. I don't speak for the U.S. Army. I don't speak for the National Guard. I don't speak for anybody else. I don't speak for the government. I just I just speak for myself. So even though I remain in the business, you know, this is all about me, and this is all about open source information, which we all have access to. 
And if you want access to all the other episodes that I just even referred to, headlinesandhistory.com, go ahead and email me, John Mollick at headlinesandhistory.com. You can go on and support the show there, links to our Patreon, and other things. All right, so I want to start with some with some clarifying comments, some clarifying quotes, if you will, from famous folks that have been doing this whole diplomacy thing for years and years and years, and heck, you know, can, can provide some and clearly provide some interesting, interesting perspectives. Okay, one one of the most famous, the 19th century um, military philosopher Clausewitz, when he wrote his work on war, very very famous. Um, read by many military theorists and, and historians and others. He was one of the most famous when it comes to the connection between military force and politics. Now, he had said, War is not merely a political act, but a real political instrument, a continuation of political intercourse, a carrying out of the same by other means. Now, he wrote that again on his work in On War. I'll link to that in, in the show notes. But his his point was basically that you know nation states were coming about in this time frame 19th century into the 20th century nation states had a way to act they had certain things they needed to do in order to interact with other nation states right kingdoms and empires were coming down nation states were growing and politics at the end of the day was the way that you were able to survive in this landscape of new nation states and one of the tools that you use in diplomacy is War, conflict, you you assert your influence, your physical, kinetic, tactical influence on another nation state in order to reach your end, in order to in order to get something done, right? That benefits your nation state, your political view. That that is true. It was true then, it's true today, and it'll be true in the future. War is not conflict is not an ends in and of itself, right? It is a means of it is a tool that we use in order to reach a greater strategic end state. But again, as I was saying earlier in the, in the episode, just a few minutes ago, people are using this military conflict to backwards in a way. They're using it backwards. They're saying, this is what's happening tactically, and then therefore it must mean that they're trying to accomplish this thing. No, we're trying to accomplish this thing and we use the military and military action to reach that point. So if we're to refer to the example I just brought up, the most recent one, which is the back and forth between Israel and Iran, there are so many comments about what happened. Now, so let's let's talk very quickly about what did happen. A little bit of a review, right? We had October 7th. Clearly, everybody understands what happened there when Hamas went into Israel. And then there was a response Eventually, there was a big response from Israel going after Hezbollah. We had the big pager operation I did a whole episode on, which led to some tit-for-tats between Israel and Iran, right? And the most recent one, and hopefully the latest, at least, you know, for the foreseeable future, was Israel attacking some air defense facilities, military-only facilities within Iran about two nights ago. Yeah, it was about, it was about two nights ago. And first, there was all of this talk about how Israel is so capable and they were going to go after nuclear sites and they were going to go after the oil infrastructure and military targets. They were probably going to take out key leaders. They were going to do all of this damage. They were going to conduct all of these operations. And I had said in the beginning, that's not the case. Israel is not going to go after Iran Iranian nuclear capability. Not, not that they can't, but they just weren't going to do it now. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And they weren't going to go after oil infrastructure either. If you go after Iranian oil infrastructure, it roils the markets, which nobody wants at this point, especially this close to an American election. We have to admit that plays a role. And so anyways, and they went after military targets, specifically military targets. So it ended up being the military targets that Israel went after. And why do we think that was the case? It's the case because Israel has a much larger plan. It has a fully involved whole of government plan to defend itself, to protect itself, to look into the future about where it sees itself in 50 years. This isn't just about what it has the capability and capacity to do 
right now and how much of a win they can get right now. Additionally, very few countries, Israel's one of them, have the ability to act without recourse from anyone. A lot of people have allies. The United States is one of them. You do things, generally speaking, within what is acceptable to your allies, especially if you rely upon that ally for support. Israel can do a lot of things on its own, but it also can't do a lot of things on its own because it relies on the United States for financial and military support. So it can't just go flying off deciding to do whatever it wants, whenever it wants, without some type of a recourse from the United States. There's so much more at play here. How about specifically the Abraham Accords? It's it's funny, the Abraham Accords was a monster deal that's still kind of in the process. This is not something that's concluded, but a monster deal that came out during the Trump administration, which in my opinion is one of the few foreign policy wins that administration had, but credit where it's due. And not once, I've been on the internet, particularly Twitter and some of these other places where some, you know, some intelligent people operate discussing these things. And even since the beginning of October 7th and all of the recourse, all of the things that have happened post October 7th, I hear very rarely, yeah, but what about the Abraham Accords? It's as if they don't exist. It's as if the deal that was worked, the discussions that were had between uh, Israel and the United States and others and the Gulf countries and, and Hamas and, and, you know, it was, it was um, Ismail Haniya before he was killed, a whole nother story, but it's not mentioned. As if Israel doesn't take into account what was happening, what the promises are, what the, what the, what the plans are or the Abraham Accords and the relationships between Israel and the Gulf countries going forward as if they don't exist. It's one of the first things Israel is going to do before it decides on how it's going to tactically attack Iran is determine how that's going to affect any other policy Israel has in the government. It, you know, the former general David Petraeus used to say it very, very well. It was, you know, it's cheeky a bit, but he said, Geopolitics. This is big boy geopolitics, right? How how can you seemingly have? How can one country, for example, seemingly have two separate and opposing ideas, and you know maybe support uh, a quote unquote a terrorist nation on one side on one hand, but not support a, a quote unquote terrorist nation on the other? The answer is sometimes those things do happen because this is big boy geopolitics. There is so much more at play here. It's not just black and white. This isn't just about Israel having the capability to fly F-35s over Iran's SA-10 and SA-21s, skirt their radar, and do complete mass devastation. That's not what the point is. You know, I read uh, one response to, again, just to this Israel and Iran issue with uh, some comments out there that Well, now Iran has the capacity and the ability and potentially the will and authority, you know, the, uh, it would be valid if Iran wanted to destroy Israel's Iron Dome, right? Israel went after Iran's air defense capability. They were quasi effective. Now Iran has the legal authority. They'd be able to do this without much pushback globally. So they'll just go ahead and destroy the Iron Dome. No, they won't. No, no, they won't. And it it doesn't, it's not all about whether they can or they can't, right? Potentially, Iran has the capability with its ballistic and cruise missile technology and its one-way attack drones with the Shahads and others that they could do some pretty significant damage to the Iron Dome. Sure, they could. Sure. I, you know, they don't have the capability to take it out, as I've heard some people say online, or destroy it or whatever, right? That's... That's not the case. First of all, the Iron Dome is only one part of a multi-layered air defense system Israel has. David Slaying, Arrow 3, all these other things. But nonetheless, I don't think they have the tactical capacity to, to destroy it. They certainly can damage it. But that isn't the point. If, if, if everything, if all decisions were made within a tactical bubble, then Iran would have destroyed Israel's Iron Dome system 15, 20, 25 years ago. 
well, why don't they? Why, why don't they just, why don't they just take it out? Well, well, because there's more going on here. First of all, the Iron Dome is one of Israel's key defense capabilities. They're not going to accept anyone removing their air defense capability that protects its citizens within Israel. They're not going to accept it. So even if Iran did go in and damage it to such an extent that it left Israel vulnerable, Israel is responding. And responding in such a way that Iran doesn't want to deal with it. No doubt. That's one of the reasons that I don't, that they don't want to do it. Are, are you, another point that I heard brought up, are, are you saying Iran likes Israel's Iron Dome to exist so they can bleed them dry financially? Yeah, right. They just want to keep shooting, you know, inexpensive one-way attack drones at Israel, and then Israel has to respond with the Iron Dome, and then they'll just bleed them dry, right? That'll just make them spend all their money, and then they, then they won't know what to do. Well, clearly that hasn't worked since 1948. When's that going to come? Right. Plus, Israel has a lot of wealthy friends, to include the United States. So, given Iran's economy and the size of their GDP, they're not bleeding anybody dry, to include Israel. Okay. No, they don't do it because there's so much more going on. They don't want such a response from Israel that the regime would be potentially in a place where it would no longer exist. And I'll add another layer of complexity when it comes to the Abraham Accords. Iran sees the writing on the wall. Ever since the Trump administration was in and Israel was making deals with Arab Gulf countries to help further isolate Iran economically and militarily within the region by, by uh, generating economic relationships, right? We're flying commercial aircraft from UAE to Tel Aviv. Never has happened before, except in the last couple of years, because of these Abraham Accord deals. These Arab countries, particularly the Gulf countries, are looking at the future of the region and they're saying, who's, who's the future here? Right? We, this whole oil-dominated singular commodity economy from the late 20th century, 60s, 70s, 80s, even 90s, right? That stuff's starting to go away. We're getting into renewable energy, and the West, in particular, is shifting away from fossil fuels. And if you start thinking deeply into the future, 50 years, 100 years from now, are we going to be relying on fossil fuels as much as we are today? I, I would argue not in the West potentially in China and India, which are growing economies, and they're going to be relying on fossil fuels for a while, sure. But is the West? Not really. And who's the dominant military and economic authority in the world today, and probably in the next 50 to 100 years? The West. Really very reason to, to uh, very little reason to believe otherwise. It's going to take a very long time for India and China to get anywhere. But that that's a whole other conversation. But anyways, they've decided, they being these Gulf countries, that it's probably the West. It's not going to be Iran, and it's not going to be the East. I mean, China is even teetering on its own economic issues with its population growth and, and the rest. So, so does Iran want to further destroy its place, right? further hinder its place in the Middle East geopolitically by causing such mass devastation in Israel? knowing full well that the Gulf countries, which they're losing, are gathering steam in a relationship with Israel. It, does that make sense? Potentially not. Potentially not. But none of these conversations, or at least I'll say very rarely, are happening when, we're, when these people online are talking back and forth about why Israel did or did not hit the nuclear sites. And they're just having these tactical level conversations. Well, they can't do it. They don't have the capacity. That's not true. Right, and then and then you have to add in the other complicating factors. Right, I was just talking big picture strategy there, I mean, big picture strategy, Abraham Accords, hundred years into the future politics. Let's talk operationally, and what I mean by that operationally is is the middle ground between tactically and strategically. Strategically, I just gave you tactically is the you know the the ability for one direct attack or two or three direct attacks and i'm i'm giving this very simplistically here but one or two direct attacks to have an effective to be effective that's a tactical win can israel 
destroy an air defense capability outside of Tehran? Yes or no? Tactical win. An operational level discussion, an op- operational level mission is in the middle. That's like the pager operation. So tactically, could Israel find a way to destroy pagers that are being carried by Hezbollah members and kill a certain amount of leaders? Yes. Tactical win. When do they want to do that? Do they want to do it today or 10 years from now? Do they want to do it in a post-October 7th-like environment? Do they want to do it when, when the next Hezbollah leader is replaced? Do they want to do it when they're attacked the next time? Those are operational-level decisions. Okay, Israel made an operational-level choice when it decided to give up the goose in its pager operation that it's been planning for over a decade. They knew it would be tactically successful, but they would eventually get an operational loss in the sense that Hezbollah and the rest of the world would now be aware of the technology and capability Israel had to pull off an operation like that. Now everybody else knows how it's done. And now Israel cannot use that capability again for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years because everyone's going to be watching out for it. That was an operational level decision. The same thing exists with the nuclear decision. Not only is there a strategic element, do I want to um, pay for the recourse, Israel saying, do I want to do I want to get all of this negative feedback if I go after the nuclear facilities? But operationally, do I want to give up the goose and say, I'm going to demonstrate to Iran how I will and can destroy your nuclear facilities? Some of that stuff is not only just, you know, classified, but they don't want anybody to know. It's complicated business. Flying these fixed wing aircraft, the F 35s or 20, or whatever they're going to use, and, and, and the, uh, you know, the standoff, bunker buster capability, GBUs, all this stuff. And the refueling it's going to take and getting around air defense and all these things. When, whenever Israel does an operation like that, it telegraphs to the enemy how they do things. And so if they're going to go after those nuclear facilities, they're going to telegraph the enemy how they do it. And they're going to describe to the enemy, boy, how far down can I go when I hit a nuclear bunker, say, 150 feet underground? If I destroy it 150 feet underground, now I'm going to give Iran two, three, four, five, six, seven years, 10 years, 20 years to rebuild another nuclear facility, and they're going to build it 200 feet underground. Is that going to extend the ability to protect itself from Israel? Potentially. So why give that up? Israel is not going to give up its capabilities on how it would damage or destroy Iran's nuclear facilities unless it has to, unless it feels that it needs to do that because of a threat, a direct threat from the nuclear capability. Israel obviously felt in their risk-reward analysis that using the pager operation felt like enough of a threat or they would gain enough win that losing the ability to do it in 20 years was not that big of a deal. So pull the pager operation today. Great. That's their choice. What they clearly don't see is the Iranian nuclear threat being so great that they have to destroy it today. It's not there. Why do it? Why do it until the time comes when you need to? Again, I'll go back to my point. It's not just about the tactical and the operational. There's so much more going on here. Who's to say, right? We don't know what these let's say, classified conversations are between Saudi Arabia and Israel, right? This is, this, this is the key win, right? Israel really wants to be able to, and the United States would love to see, a relationship developed between Israel and Saudi Arabia in the same way that Israel and the UAE are, are, are developing a relationship. It hasn't happened yet, but that would be the, that'd be the big one, right? Being Saudi Arabia being the the, uh, the largest economy, at least in, in terms of relations to, to the West throughout the Middle East, right? Huge win. Who's to say that there isn't a negotiation tactic between Saudi Arabia and Israel that says, listen, Israel, 
We can work forward on this. It's going to benefit you. It's going to benefit me. But I have some, I have some criteria that we have to maintain. I, ha- I have some, some other things. I have some promises I want from you in order for us to move forward, okay? Here's one thing. Leave the Iranian nuke stuff alone. Don't touch it until you absolutely need to, right? We, no one wants a uh, uh, nuclear-powered Iran. That's for sure. Saudi Arabia doesn't want that. But let's leave that off the table until we get to a point where maybe, you know, the region feels that we absolutely have to do it. And Saudi Arabia may have, it, may have its own reasons for doing that. So now, when Israel is preparing to respond to Iran, if it wants to maintain a, 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 the potential for a relationship with Saudi Arabia going forward, it has to take the nuclear capability or the nuclear attack off the table when it plans to respond to Iran's latest attack into Israel. Big boy geopolitics. These are things that we don't, in the unclassified world and in the open source Twitter world, we don't have access to. So it's it's valuable to have some conversations about what Iran can do, what Iran can't do, what Israel can do, but we're forgetting or what's not, what's not, not all of us are forgetting, but what's not being added in is some of these other deeply complex conversations that could help steer us to a better understanding of what really is happening. And, that, and that's ultimately, ultimately the point. If you're interested in this stuff, that's what you have to do. Now, a counter argument to this would be like, well, okay, John, if that's the case, then nobody knows everything, so why do we even talk about it at all? Because nobody knows if anybody's going to be right, and it's all just up in the air, and nobody is sitting in the president's office, and no one's sitting in Netanyahu's office, so who cares, right? We're never going to know. Let's just ignore it. That's not what I'm saying either. I'm not making the claim that because we're all ignorant to a certain level, then none of this should be of any interest to us because we have no idea. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is we need to be able to think deeply and broadly enough to use as many tools as we can to try and come up with the best answer within our purview. If we really want to care and understand what's happening here. And that's not the case. The general internet world is not using those critical thinking skills They're not looking into history. They're not looking back at what happened 25, 30, 35 years ago. They're not looking back at the the Six-Day War, which, by the way, is always involved in Israel's calculus. All the time, just as one example, when all of these things are happening. We're just looking at the right now, this minute. I'll give you a couple other uh, examples from history, One, one a little bit further back and, and one that's actually happening today, but two other examples of how this isn't just about the tactical. Why did the United States in the first Gulf War in 1991 didn't take out, why didn't they take out Saddam? Why didn't they go to Baghdad? Why didn't they take out the whole regime? Was it because they couldn't? The, the United States and its partners, the British in particular, the Aussies were there, the Canadians, but the British in particular, completely eviscerated the fourth largest army in the world in 1990, 1991, in 100 hours. It was stunning. So much so that it actually triggered China's buildup and put them in a position that they are today. Whole nother discussion. But nonetheless, stunning. Coming out of Vietnam at the end of the 70s and then returning, building through the 80s and doing what they did in 91, shocked the world. Really did. You may hate the United States, but Nonetheless, it's what happened. So it wasn't because the United States couldn't do it. They could have taken Saddam out without issue. By the way, they did do it in 2003, so it's not even even like this is conjecture. But why didn't they do it? Because there were diplomatic, strategic, operational-level ramifications that the United States didn't want to deal with. They they, They knew at the time that removing Saddam would create a power vacuum, thus making Iran more powerful. It's not the tactical. There's so much more going on. And and, and that's even a simplified understanding. There was a lot more going on. What what about today? What Russia is clearly, even though you know I'm a supporter of Ukraine, you got to look at this thing from a realistic standpoint. Russia is fully capable, tactically, 
of taking over Ukraine. There's con- we talk about it all the time online. Russia has access to so many middle-aged males, and their economy is so much larger than Ukraine's, and they have more equipment, even though so much of it's being destroyed now. If, but if nonetheless, if Russia wanted to completely take over Ukraine, they could do it. It's one of the biggest arguments the isolationists have about why we shouldn't even be supporting Ukraine. But nonetheless, then why don't they do it? Just if, if, if it's all about who can win in the moment and who's stronger and has who has more capability and who has a longer ballistic missile range and who has a better you know radar then do it take over ukraine do it right now but they're not doing it now this one's a little bit more complicated because there's some <laughs> there's some arguments in there about whether russia could even do it right now i would i would make some arguments as to how they can't given inflation some other things but nonetheless many think they could so just do it They're not going to do it. There's other ramifications that are involved. Russia doesn't really know if fully, if taking over Ukraine fully would trigger a NATO response. Putin really doesn't know that. And Putin, what Putin does know is he doesn't want a war with NATO. That's, that's for sure. And that's going back to the other conversation. That's something Iran knows it doesn't want. (laughs) Whether it has the capability to take out the Iron Dome or not, or whether it has the capability to shoot a couple fixed wing out of the sky, a couple of Israeli aircraft, what they don't want is a conventional war against Israel. That they're not winning. That's for sure. Let me give you another quote from one of my my most favorite uh, historical figures in in history. And I have two, two historical figures that I love from the British, one being... And I think I've mentioned this before, T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, which, by the way, I think I'm going to watch that movie again. I haven't seen it in a few years. I just love it. But, you know, T.E. Lawrence one, and then Churchill's another. You know, Churchill was a flawed man, as I've said many times on the show, but just just brilliant and the right man for the right time. And nonetheless, he says of diplomacy, or he said of diplomacy, rather, diplomacy is the art of telling people to go to hell in such a way that they ask for directions. I just thought that was clever. So, so true. Will Durant, famous American, to say nothing, especially when speaking, is half the art of diplomacy. Lincoln Chafee, another famous American. In the world of diplomacy, some things are better left unsaid. Meaning, not doing something is just as powerful, often, as doing something. And this tendency to ignore the strategic when we're dealing with tactical level operations is related to other misanalysis, if you will, on the internet as well, but on a on a shorter level. So this is, or on a smaller level rather. So this is a bit different. The point I want to get into here really quickly is a bit different than the whole lack of strategic awareness, but but nonetheless still applies to the lack of critical thinking and logic when it comes to making or drawing conclusions, particularly in this military conflict space. All right, I'll give you another example. There's a there was somebody that was making an assessment uh, off of imagery that they that they that they had access to of locations struck by the Israelis a couple of days ago in Iran. And the conclusion drawn from the picture. Now, some of this may have been intentional misinformation, but who knows? But Let's pretend it isn't. They drew the conclusion that Israel was ineffective because they could see in this image that this this cluster of buildings only had two or three strike locations. There were only two, three, two or three black spots where clearly uh, rockets or missiles had struck, and the buildings were still standing. They, you know, they went into this big analysis of the shadows and they looked how tall the building was and it was still standing. And they said, "Look." There's only so many potholes here or so many strike locations and these buildings are all standing. So clearly Israel was ineffective. Okay. The person that's conducting this quote unquote imagery analysis can, can in no way make that claim without knowing what those buildings are, what they're used for, what was actually underneath the two or three black strike locations that were there? Were they vehicles? Were they people? Were there? None of that was ever brought up. It was just, I see buildings in a picture, or an image rather, and those buildings are still there, so therefore I'm going to conclude that the attack was ineffective. And then they post it, and now literally hundreds of thousands of people online 
are looking at this post and they're saying, oh, yeah, boy, brilliant. Yeah, Israel does suck at what it does. Now, does that ultimately matter to how capable or not capable Israel is? No, of course not, right? It doesn't, doesn't really matter what all of these people think. Israel is going to be as effective as it wants. The United States can be as effective as we want. But nonetheless, it demonstrates an inability to think critically about some very complicated topics. No one knows what Israel was looking to destroy in that image. Without that context, you have no idea whether that strike was effective or not. None. The only people that know that are Israel. And so you can can add that image, I guess, to your calculus, and you can go across the rest of the internet, and you can start grabbing as much other information as you can, and you can piece some things together and you can say, well, in this article, in this article, in this article, you know, the Israeli defense minister said they were interested in doing X, okay? And then I saw that they were not interested in destroying infrastructure in these places, but they were interested in, go, you know, whatever, right? And, and piece together all these puzzle pieces. And then if you wanted to make a claim with all of these other data points that are relevant and true, right? it's best of your ability, then you overlay this image and you look at it and you say, based on my, I'm going to draw, based on all this data, I'm going to draw this conclusion that source one, two, three, four, five, six, I'm going to cite this, da, 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 and then add it to the point that these buildings are still standing. I'm going to say, boy, it seems pretty clear to me that Israel's maybe ineffective. Great. Great, you win a popsicle. You you you're the smart guy on the internet or smart smart gal on the internet today. I'll give you the credit for it. You at least did the work. You at least took as much information as you could gather, and you made a, a an informed decision. It's not happening on the internet today. I'll give you one more, and one that's directly related to the Israel and Iran back and forth, and that demonstrates that there really is an intention to de-escalate, okay? And this is one that that are oftentimes not, again, not being added into the discussion, and, and I, don't, I don't know why. I don't, I don't see why. But if you look at, if you're looking at the ability of one country to strike another, and you simply just look at the destruction on both ends, and you say, and then you look at the lives lost, and you say, look, no one died. Therefore, one country or one military is incapable of really doing damage to the other. To me, it's it's one of the most vapid points in all of this. One person in the last strike from Iran into Israel a few weeks ago when they shot at Tel Aviv, which, by the way, was an escalation and was rather bold. Right? That's 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 true. Even though I'm going to continue to make the claim, Iran wants no noise when it comes to Israel in a conventional war. They have stepped things up, no doubt. But how many people died in that attack? One. Every life matters. That isn't the point. But how many people died? One. If Iran wanted to kill hundreds and hundreds of people, do you think they would if they could? My answer is no. Because, because they can. And therefore, if they can, if the logic remains, right, if they can, they will. No, they can and they won't because there's a bigger point here. Same thing re- applies to what happened just two days ago. Israel didn't go after the oil facilities I had said. They didn't go after the nuclear facilities for the reasons that I had explained. What else didn't they do? They didn't kill anyone. There are four people, in pot- and when I say anyone, I mean relatively speaking. Yes, four Iranians died, potentially even five. It depends on what you hear on the internet. But there were four that have been confirmed. They worked within their air defense, you know, AAA uh, world. And they had died when Israel had struck some of their launchers and tells and other things that were in, in Iran. Four. Every life matters. I'm not saying it's not important that four people died. But could more have died? But hands down. Israel struck an IRGC facility just south of Tehran, I think it was like south-southeast, 
It was an IRGC, quote, headquarters. Nonetheless, it was a place where IRGC soldiers, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps soldiers, the most important military members in all of Iran, IRGC members worked. Potentially, are there people in that building all night long? Sure. Are there people in there during the day? Absolutely. Israel eviscerated the building. Anybody die? No. Do you think that's a choice? Yep. Without a doubt. Why? Because nobody wants Israel and Iran in particular. They don't want an escalation where the two of these two countries end up in a conventional war. And what's one of the things that you don't want to be able to accept? You don't want to explain to your, to your populace that, you're, that, that you have to deal with? Killing people. The Israelis are not going to stand for the Iranians to be shooting multiple ballistic missiles and cruise missiles and everything else into the heart of Tel Aviv and killing hundreds, potentially thousands of Israelis. Guess who's not going to accept that? The Israeli people. And the same is true for Iran. And Israel knows that. We're not looking to escalate this thing. We're looking to be strategic. And we're looking to be um, particular. We have plans for these things. We want to knock out air defense. We have a mission and a goal. You know, that, that's, that's, that's part of a much bigger picture. Right? No one, no one died, again, relatively speaking. Even though both countries have the ability to kill hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of people. They're not doing it. Guess what happened the last time somebody attacked Israel and killed a thousand people? October 7th, many people are hostages. What has happened now? The entire Middle East is turned upside down because that's the one thing that you definitely don't want to mess with is killing other countries' people, right? Iran or Israel, doesn't matter. This thing is going to de-escalate. And, and by the way, there's one more piece of information that I don't know if it if it's really has come out this week, and we'll, we'll have to see the truth to it. But the New York Times has reported that the Ayatollah Khamenei is, uh, he has cancer, he has terminal cancer, and they're looking at the, his second son to replace him. I don't remember his name off the top of my head right now. Um, I, I'll put it in the show notes when I find it. But that's a whole other complicating factor that wasn't out. Two, three weeks ago, maybe some of the intelligence communities knew, but as far as the greater public, we didn't know that. The Ayatollah is the end all and be all of everything within Iran. Yes, he's supported by the IRGC and they're, and, you know, yes, it's not that there aren't other important people, but nonetheless, this thing, the, the, Iran is a dictatorship, right? It's a theocracy. The Ayatollah means everything. He is the representative of God on the planet, if you will. Not, not literally like Muhammad, but you, you know what I mean. He's the most revered and and most well-respected representative of Allah here in the Shia mindset here in here on earth and he's in control of the entire Islamic revolution that guy matters and the fact that he has terminal cancer potentially is going to affect all of these strategic decisions that Iran is making it could make him worse it could make him less less, less devastating meaning Maybe it's because he's getting closer to death that Iran decided to ratchet things up and actually shoot Israel from within Iran, potentially. Maybe it's the case that it, Iran hasn't gone further because the Ayatollah doesn't have much time left and there's going to be some pretty big political upheaval coming. Maybe they're afraid of a groundswell of change from within the, the more... The, the youth within Iran, knowing full well that, that the time may come in the next few weeks or months. Who, who knows? But again, more stuff to be added to not just this tactical yes or no, I'm good, I'm not good. For, the, for those that listen to the show, for those that pay attention, for those that are listening and will continue to listen, you know, foreign affairs, military conflict is challenging stuff. You know, we're going to talk about specifics. We're going to talk about how intelligent analysis feeds operations, and we're going to talk about the capabilities of the F-35, vice the SA-21. And, you know, yes, all that stuff matters. Tactical capabilities, they matter. It's all, but they matter within their domain. They matter within, if your rifle can shoot farther than the other guy's rifle, that matters. But that doesn't mean that one person who shoots at another is trying to kill them or not trying to kill them. And there's more to this. I know it sounds a bit 
conspiratorial. And I've said that online in the last couple of days as well, right? I jump in and I'll, you know, I'll jump into a decent conversation about what's happening between Iran and Israel. And I'll say, hey, just remember, for a, for example, that, you know, Israel had entered into Iranian or, or came close to Iranian airspace going through Iraq. And there was this whole conversation about, well, why didn't the, uh, the Iraqis must not have seen them? Because if the Iraqis saw the fixed wing coming, if they saw the aircraft, they just would have blown them out of the sky. You know, Israel has all of these capabilities. Stop. Is it possible that Iraq just chose to not shoot down the Israeli aircraft? Is that possible? Is it possible they knew because they have access to Russian information, right? The Russians have some air defense capabilities in Syria. Is it possible they knew that it was coming? Yeah, yeah. not only possible, I think it's probably likely. Also, I think it's even probably likely they wouldn't even need to rely on the Russians. The Americans would tell them because the Americans are still looking to keep a presence of soldiers within Iraq. And it probably would benefit them if the Americans said, hey, listen, I'm not telling you where they're coming from. Just understand that the Israelis are going to be shooting through in a couple of minutes on their way to Iran. We just, we suggest just kind of stand down and, and, and stay out of it. Is that what happened? I would not be surprised. If the books come out in 30, 40 years, when all the diplomats start writing their memoirs, let's take a look. I bet you that's in there in some way. Also, it's probably just true. Iraq doesn't want any part of that. They got a lot going on right now. <laughs> there's there's a lot going on in Iraq. They're still trying to to build their very nascent democracy, even though there's so much Iranian influence, whatever. But there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. The last thing they want to do is get involved in in attempting to shoot down Israeli fixed wing on its way to Iran in a whole separate country. You know, come on. This this is complicated stuff. Right. So if you're going to, you know, if you're a fan of the show and you continue to listen, I just I just advise, I just remind everyone that big boy geopolitics is a thing. And this isn't just about, you know, who has the biggest gun and who has the best capability because there's so much more involved. And I challenge you to keep reading. I challenge you to dig into your history. I challenge you to understand the relationship between Iran and Israel if we're talking about this particular issue from 1948 on, if, you know, even if before then, depending on how far you want to go. But there's a whole slew of things going on here that's not just tied to the tactical. Okay, I beat a dead horse. Thanks. Thanks for joining me this week. I think we got out of here a little early, but it was kind of a kind of a rant episode, if you will. But I wanted to make these points. I've been making some of them online, like I said, but this is this is a better better avenue for me to get a little bit more clear and try to make my points a little bit more clear here. Listen, questions, comments, anything you have, John Mollick at headlinesinhistory.com. Be sure to visit headlinesinhistory.com for all things that are related to the show. I've got some interviews coming up. People have come to the website and said, hey, we'd love to be on. I'm writing a book or, you know, I'm interested in what you're talking about. And so we'll have some some of these interviews coming and they're and the contacts are coming right through the website. So Continue to continue to use the website, and we're going to continue to make it better as we go forward. I appreciate that. I've got some new Patreon subscribers that have come through and, and, and have joined the team, so kind of keep this thing rocking and rolling and, and try to make it as good as we can going forward. I really appreciate everybody out there that's that's joined the team. And and um, so, yeah, so, that, so that's what we've got this week. Again, look forward to some interviews coming. Um, I've got some, uh, we're going to talk China and Latin America coming pretty soon. I think we're going to focus a little bit on this North Korea and Ukraine uh, in, in issue and, and what that really means and if there's going to be uh, any you know strategic fallout from this. I, get, I think we're going to do that in a couple of weeks. So stick with us here. We're going to keep rocking and rolling every Wednesday morning as we drop. And uh, thanks again for joining me. Headlinesinhistory.com. Your host here, John Mollick, and we'll see you next week.